All right, I'm used to sitting down when we get this started, but uh, I'm going to stand up. So welcome to the 2023 Shoemaker Speaker Series. I'm really excited. We've got an excellent guest tonight, and I can't wait to hear from him. Um, before we jump into the program, I do want to convey a big thanks to John and Donna Shoemaker. They gave the large gift to make this event possible. So they're not here this evening, but please don't forget them. Thanks to, uh, thanks to uh, John and, uh, and Donna for, for helping us out here. Um, I tell you what, we're going to do a, a bit of a detour this evening. We're going to watch a video, four minute video with the onset before we introduce our guest. And uh, this video, I think, is a great, great example of when a serial entrepreneur puts together grit, energy, a few failures along the way, and some big successes, and can pull off a foundation uh, of this magnitude. And, and um, so I'm really excited to see this video, and I hope you'll be as excited. So let's go ahead and... I want to tell you about the principles of Foundation Forward. The number one principle of Foundation Forward is education. No matter what you take from this experience, it all goes back to education. Education on American history to preserve that history surrounding the time of the founding of our country. Education on government so all will know how government is meant to serve and protect we the people. Number two is access. You see, not everyone can get to Washington, to the National Archives. We want to provide access to these founding documents in communities in a proper setting. And number three is community. Having your charters of freedom allows your community a place where they can gather to celebrate, to honor, and to reflect. People ask us, why are we doing this? And we tell them, yes, it's very expensive but it's more important than money. We believe it gives us a direct link to our founding fathers by helping to preserve what it is they gave this country, a government to serve and protect we the people. If you want a monument or a setting to last, you put more underground than above ground. These are not tip over monuments. Your foundation goes down three and a half feet. It is solid reinforced poured concrete coming up into a solid reinforced core just the core and foundation of the center display weighs over 38,000 pounds, over 19 tons. There are six documents displayed. All are life-size, which means the Declaration of Independence is a little larger than the others. Each one is on quarter-inch etched bronze and weighs over 60 pounds. There is a Charters of Freedom medallion on the front, which is very special. The eagle represents the Declaration of Independence, proud bold, defiant. The seven stars above the eagle represent the seven articles of the United States Constitution. The ten stars under the eagle represent the first ten amendments, your Bill of Rights. From the beginning, this has been an education project. We learned we had two founding fathers who were very big on education, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. These two believed that in order to have a free and independent country, you must understand how government works, that you cannot control what you do not understand. Thomas Jefferson in 1789 said, educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. And James Madison wrote in 1822, a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power knowledge gives. Our hope is that our future leaders will come from communities where they have their own charters of freedom set. That your children will no longer grow up just talking about the Constitution and Bill of Rights in Washington. They'll be talking about their United States Constitution and their Bill of Rights, the ones they grew up with right in your own community. My question is, are you ready to be a part of history? Because we're gonna dedicate your charters of freedom. It's gonna be here for the next 300 to 500 years and your future generations are going to know you are here.
stage, but uh, to facilitate our introduction uh, this evening, I've, I've asked Jacob Hoops. He's a senior business scholar. Um, he is also the recipient of the Betsy Johnson Academic Award this year. So, Jacob, if you wouldn't mind coming up and introducing our guest. It is my honor to introduce our guest speaker, speaker for the evening. Born in Missouri, as it is pronounced, he has lived throughout the Midwest and the South in Ohio, Indiana, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, and has spent the last 26 years residing in Morganton, North Carolina. He is a father of four and has been married for 45 years to his loving wife, Mary Jo. 48. 48. 48, <laughs> 48 years. <laughs> He's a 1968 graduate of Easter High School in Greentown, Indiana, and he received a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Hanover in 1972. He also took MBA courses in Finance and Economics from Butler University after Hanover. He has run Patterson Fan Company since its foundation in 1989, and he, they fabricate things of, out of metal and shipping them across the country and around the world. He currently runs seven different companies, in one foundation, which we just saw in the video, and he has started 22 companies, two of which made the INC 500 list. One at number 160 in 1994, and another at number 471 in 2003. He has twice been named a finalist for the Entrepreneur of the Year in the Southeast region, and he has international business experience in Mexico, Russia, Brazil, Scotland, and Saudi Arabia. He has had seven successful businesses, which are Patterson, Patterson Fan Company, Patterson Ventilation Company, Iron Brew Company, Frenzy Tees, Foundation Forward Inc., uh, Mainstream Broadcasting, and Reserve for Fun. He's also had quite a few unsuccessful businesses, <laughs> which range anywhere from United Creative Ads <coughs> to Scrubbed and More, the uniform store. As mentioned and as shown in the video, he founded Foundation Forward Inc. in 2013, and they design, build, and gift charters of freedom settings to communities around the world. They have, around the country, excuse me. They have dedicated 26 settings from anywhere as far east as North Carolina to as far west as Carson City, Nevada. He's twice won, run for U.S. Congress in North Carolina, once in 2010 and once in 2012, finishing in second three times. <laughs> He is a biker, a scuba diver, a weightlifter, and a black belt, so I would not mess with him. <laughs> uh, here's our guest speaker, Vance Patterson. here for the next 10 years. When I was your age. <laughs> I graduated in 1972, as I said, with a BA in economics. And shortly after graduation, I realized what the value of that economic uh, degree was. It was basically to play mind games anywhere within a 50 mile radius of Hanover, Indiana. <laughs> so I took that degree, got in my 71 Chevelle, and I drove to Corpus Christi, Texas for my first job which was slinging chicken in a Mexican restaurant. It's a place called Tripp's Fried Chicken. Actually, Harold Tripp used to work for Frank Church, so it was modeled after Church's Fried Chicken. Harold, at the age of 26, thought he could, I mean, um, yeah, Harold, at the age of 26, thought he could do a better job than uh, Church's, and he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I worked there during the summer for two months. I lived in a uh, motel under a bridge, uh, in downtown Corpus, and to this day, I cannot stand the smell of Lysol. <laughs> it seems every day before I got off work, they would mop my, my uh, quarry tile floors with Lysol, and I'd get there and have to just open the door and wait uh, before my eyes stop, stop watering. So, later in that year, in August, I moved to Atlanta. I lived there five months at the headquarters for Trips Fried Chicken. That didn't work out so well, so I decided to move back to Indiana. Well, during that time, in the, those five months, I was breaking up with my girlfriend that I had dated for six years through high school and college. She was a uh, music major at Ball State, and she was just going a different direction. She ended up very successful as a musician for the Indianapolis Symphony. But I was floundering around trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my econ major. And 
one weekend I was supposed to go to Ball State and she called and said, don't come. It's a bad weekend to be here. There's a lot going on. So I got a little fraternity brother of mine, Jeff Sermon. We decided to come back down to him. So we came down that weekend, and uh, when I got here, my little brother at the Sigma Chi house, Smitty, said, we got a party Saturday night, and I just heard that Mary Jo Cody has broken up with her fiance. Would you like me to see if you can get a date? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so he called her up, asked her. Now, the other side of the story was that Mary Jo had just broken up with her fiance, and she was going to spend the evening in her room with candles and incense, and sit back and you can burn the incense and candles in your room, and listen to uh, romantic records and just kind of be morals. No, and, I was going to write poetry. And write poetry. <laughs> my wife. <laughs> she will correct my stories. Uh, so, anyway, she decided to go out. She was going to see, she knew who I was. We had never dated before because she was a freshman and I was a senior. And she figured she'd go out with this guy. She'll never see him again, have a good evening, and that would be it. So we had a good time uh, going to the party, and well, I mean, who wouldn't have a good time with Shirley Temple? I mean, she, that's what she looked like. Shirley Temple with long, nice legs. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a great time, and I took her back to the Theta House, and Christy Finnegan, who is here tonight, had closing, and she uh, was trying to get Mary Jo to go inside, and I wouldn't let her go in until she agreed to go to the SIG formal with me two weeks later. And she wouldn't do it, she wasn't sure, and Christy finally said, tell him you'll go, and then uh, you can tell him Mario won't. So, 18 months later, we were married. Oh, oh yay. <laughs> October 5th, uh, 1974. And this was a very difficult time. This was during the Nixon Ford Carter era. Um, things were really rough. We had a war in Vietnam that Nixon was trying to finance. Inflation was going up. People were starting to raid our gold supply around the world, so he took us off the gold standard. He instituted wage price controls. If you ever hear about wage price controls, run away. It is horrible from the business side. Really difficult to work with. Uh, inflation was like 14.5%. Uh, unemployment was around 15%. The prime rate was around 22% and mortgage rates were 12.5%. And then uh, Nixon had to resign in 1975 in this disgrace. So were very difficult times. Mary Jo and I moved nine times the first 10 years we were married while I was looking for work. I tried just about everything. Worked in restaurants, I worked in uh, uh, sales. One of the biggest, best jobs we had was Mary Jo and I teamed up as a, uh, selling Kirby vacuum cleaners. And we were really good. Normally they sell one out of three, we were selling two out of three. We were so good that we started feeling guilty about it. And it was really, it was, people were buying them that didn't even have carpet. <laughs> Some people didn't have carpet. So in 1978, I got a job with Steak and Shake, well, my first corporate job. Steak and Shake at the IMB Tower, downtown Indianapolis, 21st floor. I was a financial analyst. And then a year later, I got headhunted, went to Memphis with uh, Holiday Inns, corporate there, as a financial modeler. Our program got canceled after I got there, and I decided the corporate work wasn't for me. So we moved back to Indianapolis with our firstborn, Cody, uh, Cody Vance Patterson, that was born in Memphis, a southerner. And so we moved back, and I bought a Griner's franchise, a uh, Griner's submarine sandwich shop. This was my first week. We took what we sold in our house and bought the franchise and moved into an apartment. I built it up to three stores and a wholesale bakery, and, but it was all on a shoestring. And I would leave in the dark, come home in the dark, and we you were know, all raising kids. Um, then in 81, 82, there was a recession, and we lost everything. I lost the stores, I lost my company, we lost our house. We had two little kids, we had no insurance, Mary Jo was pregnant again, and I still owed the government over $50,000 in back taxes to the IRS. So we moved, uh, picked up, moved to South Carolina, I was 32 years old, and we rented a house and started over. So that was my first 10 years out of Hanover College. <laughs> Good luck, kids. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> 
boy. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about your foundation um, uh, before we get into the kind of the meat of business and entrepreneurship. Talk a little bit more about the, the mission, and perhaps your vision for for the foundation. Well, as as Anigo said, um, we were, well, I didn't tell you we were inspired to do this by a trip that we had up in Washington, D.C., the first time we saw the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We went over to the National Archives and we found ourselves wandering down these hallways looking at different displays. And then it opened up into a large uh, room and we walked through these big bronze gates into the rotunda. And there were the founding documents on the other side. Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and Bill of Rights. And they were in chronological order. And I tell people, I will never forget the first time I saw the Declaration of Independence. Something our founding fathers had actually penned. And then looked at and saw their signatures. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Rutledge, Wilson, and the others. And I just got goosebumps. And then we moved over and saw the first page of the U.S. Constitution. And those three words, we the people. And I got a lump in my throat. I looked over, and Mary Jo was wiping tears out of her eyes. It was just really an emotional experience. So we decided, uh, we left and then went back to North Carolina. And the following year, I thought about the experience. And it came to me, what about trying to duplicate that experience? So I told Mary Jo about it, and we started working on a project that turned out to be this educational project. So from the beginning, it has been about education, not patriotism, not the military, but about education. Education on the history surrounding the founding of our country, and also about civics and government. Our government is meant to serve and protect we the people. And now you're starting to hear it in the news. We started this 12 years ago about how important civics is. So as uh, the video said, or as Jacob said, we've done a number of these. Actually, to date, we have built and gifted 52 Charters of Freedom Settings around the country. In North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, Nebraska, Iowa, Virginia, um, Alabama, as far west as Carson City, Nevada, and as far north as Wasilla, Alaska. We've got 22 more coming out of the ground right now. There are 3,142 counties, boroughs, parishes, independent cities, census zones, and the District of Columbia in the United States. And our long-term goal is to place the charge of freedom in as many of these communities as possible. So people will have access to these documents in a proper setting, right in their home community, to have a place to celebrate, to honor, and to reflect. So Vance, along those lines, how, how do a typical visitor, how, what's their initial reaction when they come upon the foundation? When we were building one of these, the first one in 2014, we've always been worried about you know, people doing graffiti and stuff like that. Well, while we're building this, the skateboarder came, came through the, uh, the place where we were building it, the old Burke County Courthouse Green. And he said, uh, what's this? I said, well, that's your Declaration of Independence, that's your Constitution, and that's your Bill of Rights. And you could almost see his shoulders go back. He said, cool. <laughs> just this was a high school student. So the reaction is just, it's, it's tremendous. I mean, parents love taking their kids up and explaining what they're seeing and everything. Uh, you saw in the video, a lot of kids, uh, their teachers are taking kids to these settings on annual field trips and explaining a little about the documents, a little about the founding fathers, but also while we're there, a little about the three levels of government, uh, county, state, federal government, and the local heroes and the history from the area. And the kids just love these, these tours. So it's very good reaction. Yeah. So let's switch gears. Um, you're a Hanoverian, so you talk a little bit about maybe the connection between your liberal arts education, the foundation you got here as an undergraduate, and your success as an entrepreneur, and then maybe further with the foundation. I've been kind of amazed at, at how often my education at Hanover has come up in different experiences in life. Uh, you know, based on the, you know, the courses you take, of course, you know, you take the math and the reading and the, you know, the science. The, the obvious stuff, but the other things really that you're required to take, you know, philosophy and, and uh, world studies and, and geology and things like that that really have nothing to do with business. I've been amazed at how, how these have come up and, and certainly how it, you can 
enter almost any conversation that may have a little bit to it. Uh, I've always got something to say about something that they're talking about. Not the expert, but something. Um, I took, in, in my freshman year, I had heard that biology was where everybody flunked out. That's where the administration got rid of the freshmen. And, and biology one and biology two. So in my infant is that I took chemistry. <laughs> chemistry one and chemistry two. And I struggled through it and got through it with the mercy of, uh, of uh, Dr. Shastoff. No, uh, who was it? Ellison. 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 The strange looking guy. <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, he, he got me through it. You know, and, um, one of the first jobs I had was selling chemicals, uh, industrial chemicals, and they gave me a test kit where I had to test uh, for pH and hardness and things like that in these big factories and sell chemicals to keep them from scaling up their boilers and cooling towers. So there was that. Uh, I took German my spring term one year and so I could go to Germany. And it was a great experience. I toured around with Rich Shepard and we went to Paris on the weekends and Amsterdam and Lucerne and Switzerland, hitchhiked and everything. It was a great experience. Later, I was working for a company called Solar Shield and we were doing an industrial roof cooling system in southern France. And while I was there, it was about 70,000 square foot system, the sprinkler system that goes up on the roof. The plumber that gave me didn't speak English. He spoke French, he spoke Italian, and a little bit of German. And I spoke English, a little bit of Spanish, and German. A little bit of German. So we spent the week speaking German to each other. <laughs> and we got that system installed. So it, it, it's really kind of amazing how some of these can come out. Um, spring term one year, I took linear programming. I mean, it was really an easy course. You know, uh, for spring term. I learned ASCII and COBOL. Not how to program, I just learned those two words. <laughs> <laughs> I applied for a job at, at Steak and Shake for this financial analyst, and my boss later told me that the last thing I put on my application was linear programming. And that's what made the difference when I got the job over the other candidates. So you just never know. <laughs> I was an econ major. And uh, not a whole lot of value in what I was doing as I was going through life until I ran for U.S. Congress the first time in 2010. One of the early questions was, what's your background? I said, well, I'm a father of four, married 40 years to my wife, Mary Jo, and I'm an economics major. Oh, you're an economist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> So I was the economist of the rest of the campaign. <laughs> and finally, tying into what you've just seen, um, during the summer of 1970, I was uh, work construction and working with concrete and busting out forms and all that. Well, when I got back to school that year, uh, I'd always been, you know, been a lot of time up at, up at Mall State, and the, the Sigma Chi house up there had a white cross, and I was always impressed by that. So my, that year, uh, my junior uh, winter term, when it was getting warm outside, I decided to build a white cross. And so I went outside, the sig house, started digging a hole. The brothers came out and said, what are you doing? I'm building a white cross. Can we help? <laughs> sure. So we dug a hole three feet by four feet, went down four feet deep, and then I got a four by eight sheet of plywood, framed a cross on it out of two by twelves, had a cement truck come out, fill up the cross, put one foot of pad in the bottom of the hole, and then the next day we busted the forms out, stood the thing up, it slid into the hole with a funk, and I was really worried the darns were gonna fall off. I like, didn't sleep well that night. Well, they didn't. And then we stood it up, the truck came back and we filled the hole up. So that white cross in front of the Sigma Chi house is actually eight feet tall. It goes down four, three feet into the ground on a one foot pad, and I tell people there was more underground than above ground. Well, fast forward 43 years, I'm building Charters of Freedom Foundations, or settings, and we go down, as yours here on campus does, three and a half feet, solid, reinforced poured concrete, and I tell people these are not typical monuments. These things are built to last 300 to 500 years. And the White Cross is still standing after 52 years. Yes, hey. Very impressive. So let me, let me unpack that a little bit further, man. Yeah, so. See if I get this right. Your, your German qualified you to be a plumber. 
<laughs> your, your linear programming got you a job in fast food. Yeah. <laughs> I teach linear programming. <laughs> so we've got a lot of inspiring uh, business professionals here. Any advice for our for our students that are in attendance? Gosh, when you get out of school, you know, I, I tell people in school you learn how to learn. When you get out of school, you need to learn how to work. Get a job. You know, you don't wait to get something in your major. If you do, you know, good for you. But don't wait. Get a job. One of my friends uh, had an e econ major when he got out of school. He's working night shift at 21st Amendment. Uh, later, he got a job as a bailiff. Uh, another friend of mine uh, had, oh gosh, degree and he got his MBA. And his first job was doing uh, repo for a club for a finance company. <laughs> Not cars. This was the hard stuff, like refrigerators, sofas, things like that. Really tough, but what learning experiences, just like us selling Kirby's. Uh, get a job, get the experience, learn how to show up, learn how important attendance is, because uh, other people are depending on you to be there. I, that's my uh, best advice. I think that's good get a job. Yep. Don't wait to make to get rich. Uh, it's it's not going to happen quick. Just get a job, start learning how to pay bills, and and move on with life. The rest will come. Uh, Vans, let's talk a little bit about uh, company culture. You've got your display here, which I really enjoyed going through earlier. You know, in in the, in the classroom, we tend to rely upon academic frameworks when we try to. Kind of identify how you understand a company's culture. So we look at things like observable artifacts <laughs> or espoused values, or things along those lines. Is, is that too academic? Or does it does it map to your organization? I read that question to Mary Jo, and Mary Jo was a Latin major. You know, really smart. That's where the kids go. I always get her about studying to be a Roman. <laughs> when I read that question to her, he was like, oh my gosh, what is it? Uh, I, you know, I've said enough, I know we're too active. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I mean, why don't you explain what it is? It makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I looked it up, uh, and it's one of the Shines triad. Yes, yeah, Swiss psychologist. Yeah, and really good stuff. You know, I, I read about it. It was interesting because I'm an econ major. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, you know, the definition that was given is a physical manifestation of an organization's culture. Examples, artifacts include acronyms, manner of dress, awards, myths, stories told about the organization, published lists of values, observable rituals and ceremonies, and special parking places. <laughs> and well, that's what it said. <laughs> it did too. Uh, we, we do all of that. You know, it's, right. it's good. We do all of that except in special parking places. Uh, my COO, has, you know, we get complaints about no parking. My COO said there is plenty of parking at 7.15 in the morning when I get <laughs> So it's, it's not a problem. Um, yeah, we, we, we do all that stuff, and it's, it's good to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I had to go down through it, like the acronyms are PFC for Patterson Fan Company, DB for a double blower and a low decibel. Uh, HB and PB, we, you know, all of our fans have got acronyms like it. Dress code is casual, business casual. Uh, I'm the only one that wears a tie, and they worry if I don't wear a tie. Uh, <laughs> awards. We do a, actually quite a few awards. We've got sales bogeys where when a salesman hits uh, a certain level, $500,000 in sales, he gets to pull, uh, fire the cannon. And we've got these uh, cannons that uh, shoot a 10 gauge blank just like they do at uh, football games when somebody scores and it's really loud. So they get to do that. Uh, we've got $50 Fridays where once we hit a thousand fans shipped, everybody in the company gets a $50 bill. Except me, I don't. Everybody <laughs> else gets one. And you know, it's, it's amazing what those 50s do for people. You know, just having that extra money in their wallet and stuff. Um, we're up to around 45,000 fans now, so do the math as to how many they're getting. It's really getting painful. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just part of it. Uh, we also do attendance awards. Attendance is hugely uh, important in our company. 
Uh, I tell them that we do look at your permanent record. Yes, they do still exist. Uh, but uh, we know your attendance in grade school and everything. <laughs> we really impress upon them how important it is for everybody to be there that they're dependent upon. If you're not there, the other people can't do their work. And so we give attendance awards, and some people haven't missed work in, in 15 years. Uh, it's that important to them. They will take, they will take uh, uh, vacation days and substitute for uh, a, a sick day so they can still get the award. Attendance in our company is really important. Uh, anniversary awards. Uh, there was a myth at one time that Vance won't fire me money. And it's, it really went around the company. They believed it, and I did. I thought everybody had value. I would move from one job to another. If we hired you, we could move you around. Uh, that proved to be a myth in 2006, if you read that article. Um, you want to ask anything else? I mean, I'm good out through these, but it takes time. No, it's, it's really interesting stuff. Um, how do you, you're running a large manufacturing company, lots of process, lots of structure, and research. How do you balance that with the need for innovation and, and to, you know, trying to get your employees to take risk, risks? Uh, a lot of it comes back to um, what we're doing with the culture and everything. They know how I operate a company as far as taking risks and everything. You know, you know the definition of entrepreneurs is one who takes ownership of a process with, a, with the possibility of a large uh, loss. And people know that up to a certain point, if, if they make a decision, they could lose on this. But they know, looking at the culture, you know, what it is that we'll do and what, what it is that will work. So there's very little risk for them when they're making decisions. Um, one of the things to know about our company and, and business in general is that it's, it's not Business is not just based on greed and the bottom line, but like what you see in the movies and on TV and everything. Business is so much more than that. You know, it's it, it's about the employees and the customers and and, and all that. Uh, if you put it all together in the right culture, you're going to make money and you're going to have a tremendous bottom line. Do you want to follow up on any of? In terms of culture, yeah. Well, how does how does culture manifest in your portfolio of companies? What's it look like? It, well, I've got it posted up here. Uh, I finally wrote it down because I would. So many of the original employees weren't there, and we were losing the stories and stuff. So I finally put down what the culture is, and the culture is all important in a company. When you go out and look for a job, uh, figure out what their culture is. You know, if you want something that's woke, look for that in their culture. Uh, we're, on ours, uh, most of it is just pretty much basic common sense. Uh, the first one on our culture is the, the main reason we're here is to support our family. And we post this culture in the lobby, and so if the uh, prospective employees see it and read through it, if it doesn't fit what, what they believe and everything, that's okay. You know, what we've got to say, there's a job for everybody, but it may not be in Patterson. And, and that's the truth. You know, so figure out what the culture is of a company. One of the most popular things we've got up there is number four. We do not do drama. Uh, when drama starts up, and, and we've had that recently, uh, HR, COO, and, and, I'm, and I'm on it right away. And another part of that up there is if you can't fix a problem in a hurry, make it go away. Because you've only got so much time to work, and don't spend it working in a negative direction. So that's the kind of culture that we've got, and it, it permeates through all the companies that I've got. A uh, little bit different, little twists and stuff, but everybody knows what the culture is if you're going to be working with us. Do you have uh, remote employees? Is that an issue for you in terms of making sure they're part of the culture? No. Um, well, I, I take it that with foundation we do. And yeah, uh, it's a small group, and sure. um, they are somewhat remote. But with uh, Patterson Fan and the other companies, it's all on campus in uh, three buildings that we have there. We did have some remote workers during the, during the pandemic uh, that were at high risk, so they worked from home. And it, as soon as they could come back, they did. You know, they just felt removed from the operation, and they wanted to be there. Right. I know it works, but it didn't work for us. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about uh, failure. You've, you've got your hits and misses on, on the 
back of your card, and I'll tell anybody that, that will listen to, about that that story, because it's clearly in your DNA. And and um, you know the idea of failing fast and failing forward. This is kind of all the rage in Silicon Valley. But what do you have to say about this idea of failure? Um, well, failure is not good. You know, I mean, it's not you know, pitch the boy, you gotta get up and fail. Uh, it's almost positioned that way. Yeah, yeah. The reason I got the, the misses on the back is is because it helps explain what I do. You know, people say, What do you do? And I just kinda get this, gosh, where do I start? You know? And so I give them a card and, and and they let they see the humor in it and you know, the perspective of a lot more failures on it than, than successes. Um, let me tell you a little about how failure is looked at in other parts of the world. Because I've done a lot of international travel. As I said, I was, um, you know, finished second twice in an entrepreneur of the year in the Southeast. And so we got this invitation to go to Monte Carlo for the World Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And Mary Jo says, are we going? And I'm like, yeah, that's Monte Carlo. <laughs> so, so we went, and it was incredible, meeting people that had taken companies from zero to three billion dollars in five years. You know, they weren't the owners, but they were they were the guys that were responsible for it. Uh, I got to meet Wayne Heisinger, if you know who that is. And uh, does anybody know who that is? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, never mind. Uh, <laughs> skip that part. But what, the, the takeaway from the whole thing was we were at this uh, seminar, and it was in this round arena. Uh, first thing in the morning, I had my coffee, and. And the guy, the speaker was Lord Patton, and Lord Patton was the last governor of Hong Kong before the Chinese took over. And he was speaking, and he says, I'm going to tell you the difference between American business and European business. And I'm like, oh man, here it goes. Because we were just getting pounded over there, you know, with the, uh, Americans and stuff. He says, Americans take chances, they tolerate failure, and they celebrate success. And he said, Europeans don't. Mm -hmm. And I went, yes! <laughs> because it's true. Uh, at that time, and it may have changed, but at that time, if you failed in another country, you were done. You couldn't get financing, you couldn't get employees, you couldn't get partners, you were done. And so, uh, most of them don't try. But in the United States, uh, everybody, if you fail, they say, well, you tried, you're going to try again. Way to go. And a huge difference. Yeah. And that's why so much comes out of America compared to the rest of the world, you know, why they're trying to copy us from here. Um, well, let, let's talk a little bit. I'm getting the, the 15 minute signal. So wow. Okay, that went fast. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about international business. You've done some mentoring ah. with students at, at I and mean, I know that I know. it'll take another 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long story, but talk a little bit more about your international experience. Uh, okay, real quickly, I believe that I, you know, we were successful as a father and son and family business. I thought I could duplicate this experience going to another country. So I started out in Mexico, and I went down to the consulate and had an appointment with the uh, Commerce Secretary down in Mexico City and to find out how to do business down there. And I'll cut that short. We've got some really good friends out in Mexico that didn't work out because of the culture. Uh, you know, sell in Mexico, it's networking, you cannot sell the way we did up here. Well, later, in, uh, that was in 1992. In 94, we were in a uh, show down in uh, New Orleans and exhibiting our fans, and three Russians came in. And uh, I wasn't in the exhibit in the booth at the time, and so they came back later, and again, I wasn't there. They were looking for a partner in the United States to partner with them in Moscow. Uh, they worked with the Movan Company, the Moscow <laughs> ventilation company that was started in 1937 under the Stalin era. And they came to visit us later that year, and we put together an agreement, um, um, we put together a, a letter of intent uh, to manufacture our fabric <coughs> over in Moscow, where I was a partner. So the following year, I set up a meeting to go over there and meet with their president. and. Um, Flew, I made two mistakes. Uh, flew over there by myself and I made two big mistakes. One, I didn't take Mary Jo with me. <laughs> Number two, I didn't take Mary Jo with me. <laughs> they gave an agenda as to what was going to happen. And in the morning, it was meetings and stuff. And in the afternoon, they said culture. I said, what's this culture thing? 
And she hit me in the arm and says, that's the sightseeing. And she was right. It was amazing, the things they took me around to see. Things, uh, I went under Red Square and saw the National Armory that most people never get to see. Saw Ivan the Terrible's throne. Traveling business internationally is the way to do it because you will see things that you won't see as a tourist or even with friends. These business executives, they got connections. So I went over there and I got off the plane and the whole country, this was in 96, 97, and the whole country was, was still a lot of Kalashnikovs and stuff like that, even though the Iron Curtain had come down quite a while earlier. And I got to my hotel and they took me and took me through the company and everything and we were getting ready to go out to dinner. And I'm standing in the hallway and one of the ladies that I met, a lady named uh, Tatiana, and she was kind of the babushka type lady, you know, the flowery dress, and she comes up to me and says, oh, well, it's so good to see you here in Russia. And I'm standing out, oh, it's great to be here. And she says, well, things aren't the way they were when we visited you in the United States. I said, well, it happened. And she says, well, our president's no longer with us. I said, oh, wow. Because it's the way I went over there to meet the guy and put the deal together. And I said, what happened? And she said, he was shot. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, it's got to be a you know, hunting accident or something like that, climbing over a fence. And I said, where? And she says, over there in front of the reception desk. <laughs> <laughs> it came out in the morning, he was laying there. And I thought, oh, great. And just at that time, like in the movies, here comes Oleg, who's my counterpart. So if I advance, the driver's waiting, we have to go. So we go out, get in the car. And I got a driver, the new president, a guy named Waxman, typical Russian with big meaty hands and blown hair around and everything. And then I'm sitting behind the driver. Yelena is sitting next to me, and she's the social chairman, that's what I call her. And I'm holding, and we take off. And now here we go out to dinner, and I know one of these guys is a murderer. And here we're going out to dinner. So we go to dinner, and I'll cut that part short. But through the course of the meal, uh, you know, I'm feeling a little bit better, but still, uh, something's not right because they killed their president. Uh, we're getting ready to leave. And, and Oleg says, uh, Waxman, who's the new president, wants to know if you'd like to stop for a drink on the way back. Well, we already, you know, there are like six bottles open on the, ta on the, count on the table. We didn't drink them all, but everything was sampled. And I said, okay, I'm thinking maybe we'll stop at a little pub or something on the way back and I'll feel better about this. So we get in the car, take off, and we go down a side street, cut across through an alley, down, you know, onto a four lane street, pull up the curb to this uh, concession stand. And the driver gets out, gets back in with a bottle and three cans of uh, tonic water or something for Elena. So we take off again down the streets, a uh, couple more streets, pull up under a tree and stop, and he shuts the motor off. This is stopping for a drink, Russian style. <laughs> <laughs> they hand me the, the bottle and the glass, the glass, and I fill it up, and I say, okay, I can do this. And then I hand the bottle back. Now I realize that this is kind of traditional Russian. This isn't just a glass, it's the only glass in the car. And Waxman and I are supposed to share it. So I've got to finish the whole glass of vodka before. Uh, so anyway. Uh, I had to sneak that in. I know I cut into our Q&A. Uh, they're going to make a movie about that trip. Right. In, uh, you go forward six years. We had six years of business there. Waxman is reported. I got a letter that Waxman is no longer with us. And so I asked what happened. Uh, Yuri, who's one of the engineers, comes over and visits. I said, what happened to Waxman? They said that he was missing six weeks, and they found him in the trunk of his car. So that was the second president that they murdered when we were done. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to open it up to the audience for more questions. Uh, Carly is going to have a microphone, and she's going to float it among the audience. So if you have a question, just hold up your hand, and we'll bring the microphone to you. Who's first? Jump right in. No, we have to have questions. Right there. Go ahead, Carla. I think it's on. It's on. Um, Mr. Patterson, I want to learn, or rather, I want to know what was the biggest lesson that you learned from your largest failure? Actually, that's pretty easy. I was, I was undercapitalized. You know, I was trying to operate on a shoestring. Um, 
if you start a business, chances are you probably won't make any money for at least a year, maybe two years. Maybe so three. You, yeah. <laughs> there, yeah. Uh, so make sure you've got your finances lining up. You know, if, if you don't, then don't quit your day job. You know, just make sure you can pay your bills and stay with it. Yes? Shit, Jan says it took her 10 before she made money. Yeah. Yeah, and starting a business is very few of make money from the start. So it was being undercapitalized, you know, in the restaurant business. That's kind of lost everything. So. What percentage of people do you think who start in the business and discover that they are not businessmen? That they think they are, but they simply are. That's not part of their persona. You know, and that amazes me. The business just comes so easy, and, and it's, it's amazing how many people don't know how to do business. Uh, they don't know how to talk to banks, they don't know how to arrange for a loan, they don't know how to talk to employees, they don't know how to fire somebody without getting sued. Um, you know, these are important things. They don't know how to hug internationally. Uh, they don't know how to make coffee. <laughs> I mean, I'm one of probably six in a company of 70 that knows how to make coffee, and it just irritates the heck out of me. <laughs> coffee. But, uh, I, a number of people uh, think it's easy and they get into it and they just don't have a clue. And that's really why we need to do more of what we're doing. See, Carly, I think we had somebody over there. Close grip. Careful now. <laughs> We've been talking about the big your black from hand on run. And our lives began before that. Education. My sense is you grew up in a family that had a company, that had a history of working, that maybe had the kids get out of bed and go to work for dad or granddad. I did. And talk a little bit about your free precedence to Hanover and how that formed your discipline, your values, uh, and so on. Uh, my dad had a, and mother had a tremendous work ethic, and so that was certainly instilled in everybody in our family. You know, my little sister's here, she started her own enterprise, very successful. Uh, my brother-in-law, Donald, very successful. Uh, yeah, uh, demonstrating what what you can do for your kids uh, is, is really important. I didn't think my kids were listening. And then when I started liking them again, <laughs> I think they were 22 years old or so, uh, I started liking them again. And I realized they had listened, you know, Dad always said, uh, which is really cool. They gave me a plaque one time, uh, but I've got hanging on the wall of all the sayings. You know, that, that they grew up with and everything. It's a bronze plaque. But you're right, um, you know, having the family foundation and, and seeing your parents, you know, demonstrate what it takes. Dad had, had failures and, uh, and bounced back. And mom is really strong. That's really important. Make sure you've got the right person uh, in life with you, you know, to not just back you up, but uh, encourage you and give you the ideas. Like I say, you know, I, I definitely married up, as you did, Rick. That <laughs> question. <laughs> We've got one back here. Um, so, hi. Uh, um, I was wondering, what's been the, like, biggest um, thing that has surprised you since you came back to Hanover? Like, what's been the biggest difference that has surprised you since you came back? <laughs> really, we've come back every year. Uh, we've been here just about every year except for the year we got married. Uh, On which was homecoming day. Homecoming day. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in Jacksonville, Illinois, and that friend, uh, Jeff Sermon, has never forgiven me for missing <laughs> homecoming. That's the only one I ever missed. But, so, it's, as far as surprises, I guess probably the courses that they teach. Um, what are your program? Yeah, I'm glad I'm still here. <laughs> got me my first corporate job, thank you. Very much. You can use that story. Uh, you know, I guess the courses they teach and everything are, are different than what they taught us. 
Uh, you know, one example of what we what I learned back then that's, that's changed is in our geology course. Uh, in the book, the geology book, it showed on a map where all the oil was in the world and that we would be out of oil by 2010. <laughs> That was, I don't know what you guys remember, but they used to teach that all oil came from dinosaurs only, and then they found out all carbon-based stuff turns, in terms of the coal, dinosaurs are diamonds. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess what they're teaching is, is just different. They have the stagflation, we talked about that. That was impossible when I was in school. Now it's a common thing. Other questions? Probably have time to sneak one or more, one or two more in. I hope you're getting credit for this time. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for uh, participating tonight and sharing your history and experience with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you.